Dear viewers, welcome to Crossroads on TVI. I'm your host, Parthi Khandaval. In our last two shows, we've been able to remember our past and discuss the present situation through the release of the book, Still Counting the Dead, and the United Nations Report. However, many of us wonder how we can play a role in the future in helping to rebuild our people and land. Many ambitious and motivated youth are already thinking about how they will be spending their summer next year in 2013. In our studio today, we have two youth who have done exactly that and have given their precious time to good projects in areas that need assistance. Joining us in this discussion are Pranavan Ganeshalingam, who is a recent graduate from the International Bachelor of Business Administration from York University, and Kartika Dharmananda, who is a secondary school teacher in the TDSB. As always, please call us at 416-623-8100 to share your questions, ideas, and thoughts. Thank you, Kartika and Pranavan. Uh, so, as uh, stated, our discussion is um, volunteering abroad, and both of you have done exactly that. And uh, so I was hoping you can share your experiences and uh, thoughts on the nature and hopefully motivate some of our youth to uh, follow, you know, similar experience, uh, hopefully next summer. Uh, Kartika, you know, you're a recent, uh, uh, you had a recent trip to Sri Lanka in the north. Uh, can you please tell us what your experience was like? So I first got uh, an understanding that there was a need in the north uh -huh. from uh, Vidya Magendra, who mm -hmm. is part of one of the coordinators of Charity Ball for Hope. Mm -hmm. And she connected me to Dr. Darshan Ambalavana, who mm -hmm. works specifically in the north and east of Sri Lanka. And he told me there's a big need for English language development. Okay. And the reason for this huge need is because a lot of the students there don't know English. They're unable to pass their A&O level exams and then move further on in life. Mm -hmm. Also, it's this inferiority complex that exists mm -hmm. among them where they feel less than other people who are able to speak English. Okay. So um, it holds them back. So because I'm a secondary school teacher and I do have uh, my summer months off, I decided to this summer go to Sri Lanka and see how I can help create an English language development program. And mm -hmm. it was um, one of the best experiences I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you find the whole process in terms of acclimatizing yourself to the... So mm -hmm. one of the biggest fears going mm -hmm. was just what are my living conditions going to be, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. What's the bathroom going to be like? Mm -hmm. I'm scared of dogs, let alone other animals. Mm -hmm. So I know I was like worried about that, but mm -hmm. um, you just kind of throw yourself into the situation, uh -huh. right? I mean, you know it's not going to be the easiest of living conditions, uh -huh. um, but uh, you, just, you just do it, right? Uh -huh. And you just know you're going to you know, you'll survive at the end of the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And also for me, I lived in India for a year. Mm -hmm. Once I graduated from uh, university, mm -hmm. I was in Hyderabad. So, I mean, I did have a sense of what it was going to be like, okay. you know. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I mean, you have to expect there's not going to be a And was that in a volunteer role in a professional? That role? was in a professional role. Oh. So I was working mm -hmm. um, at a huge IT company there. Oh. And um, so I guess I was, I, I knew what to expect what in, the, terms in terms of... of the living conditions, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So, I mean, you're not going to get AC. Mm -hmm. There's lots of mosquitoes. I came prepared with all my mis my bug spray and so forth, which uh -huh. didn't really help, but I uh -huh. mean, hey, I'm still here, right? right. Yeah. We'll, we'll follow up on that experience. Pranavan, uh, you've had similar uh, volunteer experiences abroad in different countries. Uh, can you tell us this about some of the, the major experiences? Sure, I guess for me, um, I started volunteering with the purpose to like, I was looking at the conflict back home. I was born and raised here. So for me, I wasn't well versed on a lot of the stuff that was going on back home and the, the principal issues about what was going on. So it all started, I think, in 2008 for me when um, I did want to go back to Sri Lanka in a volunteer context. I, I was there ba back in 2006, right before the peak of the conflict. And at that time, it was just more so just getting to know the area, visiting family and friends. 
So in 2008, I did want to get up and go. It was the, my f first summer of university and I had four months off. So I had to decide where I want, what I wanted to do with that summer. Mm -hmm. um, I had the choice of, you know, working in an internship or spending some time at home, but I really wanted to go abroad. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to just pick, pack up my bags and go. So I did a little bit of research and I found that uh, th there was a similar conflict. Obviously, a lot of us know about what was going on in Israel, Palestine, in the Middle East. And I was able to, through my research, I found a lot of parallels with the conflicts that were going on. In 08, obviously, I, it was it was the height of the conflict and I couldn't really go there. My parents would not mm -hmm. allow me to go there. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of issues with flights and stuff and vi getting a visa regardless. Um, so I actually decided to pack my bags and go to the Middle East. Um, mm -hmm. I flew into Jerusalem, mm -hmm. where uh, the capital of Israel, and I got into contact with an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And they were, they're like a non they're a group of rabbis, nonpartisan, like they're right on the green line. They mm -hmm. don't take sides and mm -hmm. they're very well educated and well versed on both sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so I spent a lot of time volunteering my time in, in, in a place called Kalandia, mm -hmm. which is like in the West Bank. And uh, like my experiences were... Was that in the heart of the... Because I know the West Bank comes up a lot yeah, in the conflict. Yeah, that, that's, that that's the, 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 the zone where everyone's fighting, like about, right, okay. right about so, around the green line. So, so what was the nature of your work? Um, first, it, it all started off with... It, it was it was with an organization that I work with called Operation Groundswell. Okay. And so our initially I went in thinking just to get a little, for me it was like I wasn't really, I was very ignorant on the issue. Mm -hmm. um, being born and raised here in North America and a lot of the media being very uh, one-sided and mm -hmm. biased, mm -hmm. I wanted to go into the area and talk to people and get to know what the conflict was about. Mm -hmm. And so m the nature of my work primarily was we were working with Bedouins who are the nomads that are always displaced. Uh -huh. You can compare them to the people in Venue who are always moving around and like uh -huh. they're being displaced by because of the, the war. The war. Um, and so we spent some time building a school for them. That was our primary uh, motive uh, mm -hmm. out of like mud and uh, rubber tires. We mm -hmm. stacked them up, filled them up with mud and cement and concrete. Mm -hmm. It was an Italian NGO that, and an Italian architect who came in and led the project and we worked with him. Uh -huh. And that was like just on the outskirts of Jerusalem. So uh -huh. that's where it all started off. And then from there, I said, stay back, uh -huh. spent some time with the Bedouins and we built the soccer field like in the desert and mm -hmm. it was awesome. Like what, I, so what? Uh, fueled you to pursue this type of work in conditions that are obviously not the greatest? Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I guess, uh, so for me, like being born and raised here, yeah. I'm, we live like kings and queens here in yeah. North America. Mm -hmm. And for me, like I didn't, I didn't have to go through the experience. I had an easy life. I didn't have to go through the experience of living through war. Um, that was one thing. And also just to get that experience. And the other thing was my ignorance. Like, I was living, I realized very quickly that I was living in a bubble here mm -hmm. in Canada and in Toronto, in Markham especially. Uh -huh. um, and I wanted to get more of a broader a folk aspect of like the world that um, uh -huh. just get to know what the issues and things that are going on in the world. So if that was what, those were the two main factors. Was it also I, connected to your education? I know you're studying your business administration at international yeah. level. So again, like when you, when you think about volunteering, you also want to think about your purpose. And for me, uh -huh. um, I thought of it as work experience. For me, I, I had the opportunity to take an internship that summer, but I decided yeah. that I'm a little too young. I don't want to jump into the workforce a little too early. So, uh -huh. yeah, I did study international business uh -huh. and I knew that I would be going on exchange my third year. So this is my chance to get myself out of the country and, and to get a little experience uh -huh. of the world. Kritia, what what fueled you to do this? I think, number one, I had the time. Uh -huh. So knowing that I had the time, I didn't want to just sit at home and not do anything. Uh -huh. So I, I, like, I always had the thought, I'm going to make use of my two months. Okay. And I just thought, now is the perfect time. I have it. I don't have any responsibilities. Uh -huh. What can I do? Uh -huh. And this opportunity presented itself. Uh -huh. And so I just thought, let me go for I it. I know on uh, the write-up you had on the Charity Ball for Hope website, you said you always had a desire to give back to our people. And how do you think, I know it's a, it's a deeper question, but how do you think that came about, that, that desire, that need to, to do something positive to those of us from our community who weren't able to leave, who are, who 
great interest. Well, I think it's just hearing the stories, right, that we uh -huh. see through media or through people we know who've gone back home, uh -huh. and you see the need that's there. Mm -hmm. And I, and for me, it's just people that look exactly like you, mm -hmm. right? People in a, in a situation that could have easily been reversed, that could have been me, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. who was there, who didn't have the same opportunities, so, right? Uh -huh. As whereas I do. I mean, you know, I was lucky enough. Uh -huh. to, I guess, come to Canada and to have the opportunities that I do. Uh -huh. And I just thought, um, let me go back and, you know, try uh -huh. and impart some of, right, what uh -huh. I can to them. Mm -hmm. So it's just the fact that th these are people that look exactly like me and who are me. Uh -huh. And I was just lucky enough to get the opportunity. Uh -huh. When you came back, how did, what was the response from your peers? And those, was there greater curiosity from peer, like youth, uh, wanting to do something similar to what you did? Definitely. I All think right. um, just from telling people about my experiences, everyone's quite happy with what like what I did and uh -huh. you know quite admirable of what I did mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a definite desire of other people wanting to do it uh -huh. but it does take a lot of guts okay. right to go back and uh -huh. um, like it was an impulsive move uh -huh. when I decided to go back. I mean, uh -huh. I always said it, but yeah. I didn't know in what form. Mm -hmm. And this opportunity presented itself. So uh -huh. just for me to like have the guts to do it. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to have friends push me to go as well. Uh -huh. um, other people, they have the desire, but I mean, it's just right. Actually going through with it is mm -hmm. another story. Um, pardon me, when you went, were you the first in your batch or did you did you feel that you were an outlier in terms of I'm guessing you're 18 19 at the time yeah. when you went <clears throat> abroad in your first semester yeah for me it was actually like I was actually looking for some friends within people within my group of friends and network to go with because I mm -hmm. for me like I didn't I don't like the whole uh, vacation package deal kind of thing I uh -huh. really wanted to backpack to pick up a backpack and go and I didn't have anyone within my network uh -huh. to go with so yeah it was so, me on my own kind mm -hmm. of thing and so when you came back what was the response from your friends and your um the, the kids in your program so again com when coming back like uh she said was it's just a lot of spreading word like uh -huh. sure i've gone through the experience but uh -huh. that's only like uh, it's only my life that's been touched or whatnot right okay so coming back and spreading the word is very important especially when you're volunteering abroad and just uh -huh. educating a lot of my friends and mm -hmm. that's what i did uh i a lot of my friends because of hearing about the stories and my experiences. Did they end up doing They it? were very motivated to go through with it as well. And uh -huh. so I actually got a few of my really close friends to go on one of these trips as well. And that just kicked their their travel bug off and they've been no, going crazy uh -huh. like since. Right. So it's just, I guess for me and like for us, it's like just that first time, uh -huh. you need someone to push you and motivate you that first time. Once you're out and once uh -huh. you've gone over that barrier, uh -huh. um, the possibilities are endless and you just want to keep going. There's mm -hmm. Uh, Karthi, uh, we've talking very macro level, right? Uh, can, can you give us a, uh, you know, a day, uh, a sample day, a typical day when you were teaching English to what I'm, I'm assuming they're young children? Uh, I taught a variety okay. of uh, so people. What was so, a typical day like? So a typical gate, a day was that uh, there was no set program. Okay. So I was there and... Um, and which, sorry, which village or town? So I was in Kuditane. Uh -huh. I hope I'm pronouncing uh -huh. it right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, which is about 20, 30 minutes auto drive from Neliadi. That's the closest city. Okay. So just for reference uh -huh. point. Uh, and I was in this uh, church missionary. So mm -hmm. it was quite safe, like the compound. Okay. So the coordinator of that missionary was just like, okay, you tell me what you want us to do. We have okay. 200 kids that are coming here every day. Uh -huh. You tell me. Uh -huh. So I had the, I guess, the opportunity to do whatever I wanted with these kids and uh -huh. set up the program however, however I wanted. Mm -hmm. So my typical day was I would wake up at 8.30. I'd get an amazing breakfast, mm -hmm. right? Um, after that, uh, I would work with the primary school teacher uh -huh. and I'd work with about 15 kids. And uh -huh. what I would do is I would teach the primary school teacher okay. English words that she can impart to the students, okay. right? Because uh -huh. I thought that was more sustainable than uh -huh. me just teaching mm -hmm. the kids. Mm -hmm. So that was for two hours from 9 to 11. Uh -huh. After that, from about 12 to 1.32, I'd work mm -hmm. with another set of students. Mm -hmm. Then from 3 to 5, I worked with the core set of um, students with a higher aptitude for English. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and then in the evening, that around 8 to 9.30, I worked with older people from the community. So I okay. worked with 
uh, the Grama Silvai from the community, who's uh -huh. basically like the village coordinator. Okay. Then um, some English teachers and just uh -huh. people who wanted to learn. Well, let's you know, play English. a clip about to see some of the fruits of your hard work this past summer. Uh, you could play clip one. So it must have been heartwarming yeah. to, to see those children. Yeah, yeah. so they, they were actually practicing for uh -huh. a English concert uh -huh. that uh, all the students who I worked with uh -huh. did at the end. And it was the first ever all English concert all that happened uh -huh. in the village. And uh -huh. part of it, I remember there was, uh, we did a spelling competition. Mm -hmm. And so I remember I'd come up on stage and, I'd, uh, and I gave the students a list of, I think, a hundred spelling words for them to practice. Right, right. So I'd uh, ask them, like, spell building, uh -huh. right? And let's say if the girl got it wrong, uh -huh. the audience would still clap because they didn't know if it was right or wrong, <laughs> okay, you know? Right, right. And, but it was like just, be, just seeing uh -huh. it, you uh -huh. know? And like a lot of the people didn't even understand uh -huh. How the was the, words, the connection you had with, I guess, perhaps emotional connection that you had with, uh, the children as well as the staff. Yeah, it was oh, it, it like? was quite amazing because uh -huh. we had so many similarities. So uh -huh. when I first went there, my first day, um, nobody would talk to me. So mm -hmm. for example, the uh, teacher who taught English wouldn't talk to me because uh -huh. she was intimidated. Uh -huh. So I felt a lot of intimidation from people uh -huh. who kind of uh, stayed away from me a uh -huh. bit, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And they were just nervous, I guess. Mm -hmm. And put me, I guess, on this other level because mm -hmm. I'm from Canada when okay. really I'm just like them. Yeah. So it was really great because I felt like their confidence got lifted, like uh -huh. I'm just like them. Yeah. I mean, um, they would make fun of my Tamil, right? right? And then I'd be like, my Tamil's horrible, your English is horrible. Right? <laughs> we'll we'll learn together. Yeah, so yeah. it was just great because uh -huh. I think I put them at ease, they put me at ease, and we really connected. And uh -huh. I think they were surprised too how much uh -huh. we got to connect. Is right? it a challenge now to, to continue that connection? It is a challenge because uh, uh -huh. I do try and... Uh, keep contact through Skype, but mm -hmm. because the network is so bad there, especially oh. in that village, mm -hmm. um, it, it's really, cu it cuts off a lot. Uh -huh. And also it's hard for them to understand my English uh -huh. over Skype for well, some reason versus in person. Because I think person. there's things in, you know, eye contact, facial yeah. expressions and body language. Yeah, and also uh -huh. email, we try and keep in contact uh -huh. and the emails I get are how are you? Like that's ah, the email, okay. you know, and I'll, I'll do a paragraph, but I guess because their English is so low, it's ah, hard to kind of to maintain like a really fruitful uh -huh. kind of co uh, contact. Pranavid, can you tell us the, kind of the, the connections you had while in Israel or in Tamil Nadu? Um, I guess I can speak more to my experience like in uh, Israel, in uh -huh. Palestine and the West Bank area. Uh -huh. um, I guess one of my really fond memories is uh, for me, like um, I'm a little darker skinned. Uh -huh. uh, I spoke. I tried to pick up as much of the language as I could. Okay. Arabic, not uh -huh. uh, not uh, Hebrew. Israel, okay. Hebrew uh -huh. um, just because the, most of my work was with the Palestinians okay. and the minority. Um, so one thing that that like, I was able to connect with was uh -huh. that they called me uh, Abu Samra, which is like the father of the dark skins. Okay. I was a lot darker <laughs> than the population yeah. there, uh -huh. and that really like if anywhere I went in Palestine or West Bank, mm -hmm. if I if they would ask me. Keith Halek, what's your name? Mm. How are you? Mm. And I'd just say Abu Samra and they'd drop to the floor laughing because uh -huh. to them it's, it's, it's a respectful thing. If you're re darker skinned, you're uh -huh. more royal or something, something like that, uh -huh. a little bit cultural thing there. But uh -huh. uh, that really broke the barriers in anyone that I met. And uh -huh. even though I can speak much of the language, it really helped. And for me, just trying to assimilate myself in the culture mm -hmm. really helped as well. So I wore the kifa, I wore, wore the headdress mm -hmm. um, and I, tr I prayed five times a day oh, with them and okay. when I spent like for example a typical day I'd wake up like they had makeshift uh, cabins with like sheet metal and mm -hmm. cloth mm -hmm. we normally sleep on the top of it with like 
blankets which had like tons of bed bugs in it. Okay. All right. It was crazy, but I don't want to over glorify it. It's uh, it was tough conditions, but yeah. it was like the middle of the desert. It was freezing cold at night. Okay, um, it's but time for a quick break, dear viewers. Please join us again. Always call us at four one six six two three eight one zero zero to share your questions and comments. Welcome back, viewers. Uh, joining us in the studio today are Kartika Dharmananda and Pranavan Ganesha Lingam, who are two youth who've spent their precious time volunteering abroad and here with us to share their experiences and motivate other youth to do similar activity. Um, one question that was on my mind is the volunteer short-term experience versus a long-term experience. And I know uh, for you, Kartika, it was more because you had to get back to work, you're a secondary school teacher. Uh, what are your thoughts on youth who are interested in doing this, who may want to do it for, say, four to six months or even a year, compared to uh, one month? What What do you think? I think if you have the time, do it. Okay. Because the longer time you spend, the more integrated you get in the community and the more uh -huh. you get to experience, right? Mm -hmm. And the greater impact you get to make, mm -hmm. right? So four weeks or one month, the mm -hmm. time I spend is a very short amount of time, mm -hmm. and I wish I had more time and because I would have spent it. Uh -huh. So for those who are, you know, in school and do uh -huh. have like that greater time aspect okay. that they can afford, I say do it. Uh, some are speaking to a, a friend of mine who's, you know, working in a professional job. He can only take maybe two weeks off. Is it worth it to to go for what it may be only 10 days if you, if you f factor in travel time? What um, are your thoughts on like, is... To go to Sri Lanka? No, yeah. I don't uh -huh. think it's worth it. Like given uh -huh. the costs associated with uh -huh. and the amount of time and the impact you can make, uh -huh. personally, I don't, I don't see a point. Like if you want to what volunteer, would you say is the optimal? I, uh, optimal, I would say is a month, uh -huh. honestly, like uh -huh. in terms of really doing something, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Otherwise, I just like cost versus benefit, just like being a business mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't see as much benefit mm -hmm. personally. What, how long were your, I know you spent a month and a half in Israel and Pal mid Middle East. Yeah. Uh, how about in Tamil, in uh, Tamil Nadu you spent some time? Yeah, in Pondicherry, like it, that, that particular volunteer experience was me taking a group of uh, North Americans and I led a trip to uh, India, north and south. Uh -huh. And so in the south we spent about three to four weeks okay. and then in the north we switched shop and went up north for about a month and a half. Uh -huh. And how do you find the time period, the, the role the time period plays? Like a month and a half versus three weeks. Um, again, like you know, the minimum I would say one month minimum. spending time at at one site. Uh -huh. um, it's just because yeah, like the time it takes to get accustomed to it, to foster the relationships, and to mm -hmm. really make an impact. Also, mm -hmm. as a volunteer, you got to remember that you need to have patience. Mm -hmm. It's very hard unless you're going with an organization that's set everything up. It's very hard for you to go in and make an impact from day one uh -huh. and get out in ten days, right? Yeah. So that two week idea notion is not really there. That two weeks is meant for a vacation down south. It's okay. not. It's not All right. for volunteering. On, on the topic of organizations who set up these you know, volunteer trips, right? There's some concern from people who think it's become a commodity. Some will say it's almost a business to set up these packages where youth from North America go to these second and third world countries to do good, well-intentioned, but they charge upwards of, of $5,000. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on, on these organizations? Is it still a good or is there a business behind it, a profit motive? Um, as a business student, I can right. tell you that it's a very lucrative business. Okay. Um, so it is true. Uh -huh. It is true, but you, that's why, this is why doing your research is very key. Okay. That's not to say that there aren't really good organizations that, um, where they charge minimum fees just uh -huh. to cover administrative costs and to get you into the country. Uh -huh. um, I would say like for a one and a half month program, mm -hmm. about $2,000, uh -huh. ballpark is, is a good, is a good is a fair amount, uh -huh. not including flight, okay. to help you with, as long as it covers all, you have to find out also, it's all about doing research and finding out the right organization and see uh -huh. what the, the fee that you pay is going towards, what costs are covered and what costs aren't covered. Uh -huh. um, so like I would say $2,000 for a month and a half, uh -huh. not including flight, is, is fair. Mm -hmm is fair by North American standards, just to cover all in-country costs, okay. given that the placement's set up and everything. Mm -hmm. And so 
I would say the biggest piece of advice is just do your research because there are organizations that tra- to charge, some of the larger organizations that charge $5,000 for two weeks mm-hmm. in Africa. Um, honestly, speaking from a business point of view, because those organizations are so large, uh-huh. the administrative costs, the organizational costs are huge and that's why they have to charge that much. Uh-huh. So stay, staying uh, grassroots and staying uh-huh. with some of the smaller organizations will be more budget friendly and also I feel would give you a better experience because they're mm-hmm. more tied in with a specific area or a site mm-hmm. or in terms of volunteer work. Karika, how did you find, did that play a role in your decision? Well, yeah, finances is huge, right? Uh-huh. And so for me, I luckily have this friend, Prashant, who works for the airlines. Uh-huh. So I got a standby ticket, which uh-huh. helped a lot with my expenses because uh-huh. the flight is probably your main expense. Uh-huh. And then when I was there, they covered my food and uh-huh. my um, my stay uh-huh. there. So my costs were very, very minimal. Mm-hmm. Going with an organization mm-hmm. where the itinerary is all set up for you, mm-hmm. um, it's great probably especially for parents Uh because it kind of eases their mind Uh in terms of they can see the structure Uh um, and also for anyone going right Uh there's kind of like Mm -hmm. you're very clear in terms of what's going to happen versus Mm -hmm. going into something where you're doing it on your own or Uh more unplanned Uh um, you'll probably get a better experience Uh just because you'll you'll see more it's Uh not so structured and Mm -hmm. the unstructured like the lack of structure helps you, I mm. guess, experience different aspects you would know. During realize. both of your volunteer experiences, at any point did either of you feel, you know, you're really frustrated and you just wanted to get out of the situation? Did you ever have that feeling? Of, For me, it was yeah. before I went. Okay. That's where the frustration was. Uh-huh. So I was very, very close to canceling my trip uh-huh. um, because, because I was going to Sri Lanka and uh-huh. I was going... Uh, traveling with a friend Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, like you know there wasn't like a set program in place with an itinerary and so forth so I mean just a lot of people are like it's not safe what are Uh you doing why are you going Uh right Uh to do something else Mm -hmm. so forth Mm -hmm. I mean I called Vidya who's the coordinator of charity ball said I don't know if I want to do this Uh like and and it was it's scary I mean it takes a lot of guts and so forth Mm -hmm. and then like I said I just had a friend who pushed me so that's where the frustration came as Uh soon as I got there and I realized it wasn't as bad as everyone was saying Uh Uh I didn't feel in danger whatsoever obviously you have to be smart you know I'm not walking up and down the street at Uh you know eight o'clock or nine o'clock and you were an organization that was established yeah so I was in like a very safe church compound Uh right Uh so I mean I mean, it's just about being smart, right? Uh-huh. And uh, Pernamon, you I guess in, uh, in all your experiences? Yeah, I guess something I could speak to with regards to that, um, the frustration was um, when I took the group to India in Oroville particularly, uh-huh. um, I guess this is, again, my fault, and this is where I learned my lesson of not doing enough research, uh-huh. and this goes for all volunteers that are going abroad, not doing enough research about the place that you're going to and what you're going to be doing and whether how things are set up. Because uh-huh. honestly, what happened was we arrived, I arrived there with a group of 12 students, uh-huh. and um, the way... Oroville, it's, it's been, it was set up, and the Kibu team in particular that we were volunteering with uh-huh. was set up for individual volunteers who just came in and like just came in without notice kind mm-hmm. of thing, and mm-hmm. they were just put into a project. So what I found frustrating was like our dynamic, our group of, like the goals of our, uh, my group was didn't fit in very well with the, the, the way the system was set up at that Kibu team or okay. in Oroville. So that was very frustrating. And so uh-huh. what happened actually, our plan was to be there for two months. Uh-huh. We actually jumped shop in two weeks because okay. it just wasn't working for us. And so we decided to go to the go to Chennai, get our own apartment. Uh-huh. And when you, what happens when you have a disagreement with the organization that you're volunteering with? And because you're obviously that's not your home and you don't have the security of a network how yeah. do you voice your concern you always you d- always ask questions okay. usually with when you go with organizations uh-huh. there is a support group that's that comes with you paying that fee right uh-huh. there's always someone that you can call uh-huh. either back home or uh-huh. within the the home base of where you are right now at, uh-huh. the, at the current time um, but also just in general being very open-minded uh-huh. having patience and the flexibility is very key those are key qualities to any volunteer because uh-huh. um Life there is not going to be like how it is here at home. Mm. You can make decisions on your own and stuff mm. like that. So I guess just being open-minded and flexible because mm. not everything is going to go according to plan either, right? You mm. might have a plan for two months. It might, it might change. probably will not be that way. Uh, Karthia, did you ever feel that, um, you know, that there was an op- avenue if you disagreed with some of the work that was being done or the direction? 
that you could voice it or do you kind of have to, if you volunteer with an organization, you've got to go? Well, um, I was lucky because um, um, I think uh, the organization I went through, uh -huh. they were very open-minded and uh -huh. I knew I could voice my concerns. And mm -hmm. I think I made it clear from the beginning that if anything's wrong, I'm out. Like, uh -huh. I'm, I don't care how much money it costs me, I'm buying uh -huh. a plane ticket, I'm gone, right? Uh -huh. Especially since um, I wasn't with like a, like a set group or okay. anything uh -huh. like that. Uh -huh. So because of that, mm -hmm. I guess I felt very comfortable. And you have uh -huh. to be strong enough to know that yeah. whatever happens, uh -huh. if you don't feel comfortable, just get out right get mm -hmm. out of it mm -hmm. one uh, you know uh, critical question that comes up in these volunteer abroad programs is that oh. sometimes you know oh. the, the way the organizations pitch the experience is that they make the kids a commodity and they're trying to sell an experience uh, do, have you found that to be the case with uh, uh, the marketing with some of these groups organizations that offer volunteer experiences that it's it's taking away from the experience of the kids and the kids are used as a marketing tool um, I think there is some kind uh, of glamorization of you're going in there and you're saving the world right uh, uh, by building a school or doing whatever it is you're doing uh, right uh -huh. and I know one thing for me is I don't want to push you know my Canadian values on these kids uh -huh. or you know this is the right way of doing things uh -huh. right that uh -huh. kind of like yeah. Western mindset set, yeah. and I think um, and because I wasn't with this set organization I didn't have those issues okay. right because um, uh -huh. but I know some of these organizations I feel like it's almost like I'm saving the world uh -huh. kind they of. present it like that they yeah. present it like that so yeah. you come out feeling yeah. like oh look at the amazing work I did when okay. really it's like come on you spent three weeks like uh -huh. you know putting yeah. some like bricks on top of mud like uh -huh. yeah it was great but it uh -huh. wasn't you know what i mean like uh -huh. don't take it to another yeah. level Pertivin, did you feel um, um there's a glamorization of i would there? say thankfully no i have uh -huh. not come across any of that kind of okay. stuff and uh -huh. i guess the key to that and the reason for that is because i stayed away from the big organizations uh -huh. the big box organizations because uh -huh. i try to keep it really small and i uh -huh. try to target some of the small organizations that are upcoming and uh -huh. with again with charities or any of this non-profit kind of stuff when they get too big uh -huh. it becomes like a business minded uh -huh. focus right so i stayed really small and um yeah they do over glamorize a lot in terms of you're going to go in and change the world but as a volunteer you need to also come to terms with that uh -huh. The earlier you come to terms with that, the better. Uh -huh. But that's not to say that you shouldn't go and volunteer, right? Mm -hmm. You going in and making that difference for that one child or two children uh -huh. in that school that you're volunteering in or making that connection and making them feel important. Uh -huh. As a Western Westerner coming to that country and uh -huh. making that child feel important is a big thing. Uh -huh. It's not to say it's not to say that it's meaningless, mm -hmm. but um, it, we got to take it one step at a time, right? And you're not going to save the world, but... Yeah. And an another um, concern that comes up in this discussion is the idea of knowledge transfer. You know, Kritya, you mentioned some groups, you know, you go there and you build a house, right? And then that's it, right? And whereas the argument is that they're not learning anything. The, the recipients of this aid or um, volunteer work are not receiving anything. Do you find that some organizations may uh, give kids the opportunity to build something or do something, but there's nothing being transferred to the people there um i can speak to my uh -huh. experience um with respect to building those mud houses and the schools uh -huh. um i was the only fo myself and the architect from it italy were the only two foreigners okay every single male hmm. of 14 or 12 years and above were okay. working on the site they were the ones primarily building it mm -hmm. we were just the motivation the push and for me i it wasn't i wasn't even meant to go there i uh -huh. kind of stumbled into the community mm -hmm. and it was actually a funny story but yeah i was going actually somewhere else and i got dropped off in the middle of nowhere mm. and i found these people so that's how it happened so i didn't even know about it actually i didn't plan on going there i didn't plan on going there but mm -hmm. um yeah so just to address that point it was all local people that were mainly building it and so yeah i guess the my key piece of advice is do your research do what your organization research. you're going with and who's involved it, again it's like uh just making sure that the locals are also involved as well, right? Because uh -huh. it costs a lot for to send an, a person from North America to these countries. Yeah. Kritia, so, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, yours, uh, your experience obviously was a knowledge transfer mm -hmm. experience. You're teaching English. A question, was it, uh, do you think it was responsive to the local needs? Were the, ch were the 
children, the youth, they are looking for English language training? 100%. Uh -huh. So for example, um, I did interviews uh -huh. for like the core English group I wanted to work with more uh -huh. intensively. Uh -huh. Given my time constraints there, uh -huh. I thought I could make the biggest impact. So I interviewed about, I think it was probably close to 200 kids, just to get a sense of which ones had attained mm -hmm. a greater grasp of the language over uh -huh. others. Uh -huh. And I picked from that group, I think, 30 kids. Okay. The ones who didn't get selected uh -huh. were crying. I had an aunt come to me begging, like, please let my son into like your program. Okay. And yeah. literally, it's just a one month, mm. you know, program, mm. right? Uh -huh. It's not like they're going to learn the language from it, like yeah. begging, you know, that mm. they wanted to But you come. can't teach more kids than Yeah, it was just uh, impact, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, I could I could do all of them, but, but then they, weren't, or they wouldn't be getting as much, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a huge desire mm -hmm. there, and it's just a matter of the resources, right? Okay. Uh, before we go to break, we have a clip showing a similar organization called Visions that does work in... Uh, in the north in Sri Lanka, in the Vanni, as well as in Tamil Nadu, and it shows some of their volunteers speaking about their experience. When we first come in, some really have never known what leadership is or even known that word before. And so I think um, it's something we take for granted, these skills that we use in the US that these children are not getting. Instead, they're memorizing words in a book and spitting them out, and I think it's they need some type of practical work that can help them. Well, leadership in the first place is something that's very hard to teach, but I think Visions takes a really good approach because they split it up and have, you know, the lessons section, but then they also give the students hands-on time and we actually watch them do leadership activities themselves. To build up their confidence, to have them understand what it is to, to even shake hands with someone in a confident manner to be able to tell someone who they are and what their story is. It's going to help them in school, it's going to help them get jobs, and it's going to help them in their family situation, in their communities. And I really think that that's an aspect that's forgotten a lot. And education is what's going to make them have a better life, and leadership is a part of that. Welcome back, dear viewers. On our show today, we're discussing the topic of volunteering abroad with two youth, Kartika Dharmananda and Pranavan Ganesha Lingam. Um, what, from your experiences, Pranavan was yours have been about three, and Kartika, from your experiences, you're like, what were some of your favorite stories or anecdotes that really you'll always remember from your experiences? I guess um, for me, the biggest uh, something that really stuck with me was. Uh, the relationships I built with uh, the Bedouins in in Palestine, um, I became very good friends with them. Mm -hmm. uh, th like I felt like I was one of them. Um, uh -huh. Not only like I did make the extra effort of learning the language and assimilating with their culture and stuff, but uh -huh. they really like we really connected on another level. And I don't know how to describe that, but the relationship that I built with a lot of these guys was, and there was a lot of the men also. You got to look at it in cultural perspective. I wasn't. Uh -huh. I didn't see any women. Uh -huh. They were all inside their huts. Like okay. I could not be exposed to that. It's just uh -huh. the, the Muslim culture, religion. Um, but meeting these guys and just getting to know them, and even though there was the language barrier, like I only knew maximum like 20 Arabic words, but being able to smile and say yes, and a lot of the communication was through sports. Like I played soccer and they loved football. Uh, to them, football is just kicking a ball around, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But we were able to connect a lot like that and through that to, through sports. Um, so language doesn't always have to be a barrier mm -hmm. when volunteers are deciding what kind of countries they want to go to. Mm -hmm. um, just knowing the basics is good enough. Okay. But um, just remembering this one kid, uh, Abu Nasser, uh, he'd always, like in the mornings, he'd always come up, he was like four or five years old, and he'd always come up to me in the morning, wake me up at four o'clock to go pray. And he was my, like, my alarm clock. He okay. was always wanting to play with me, and I, it, I, I loved, like, he, uh, yeah, I just, I felt like he was my kid. Okay. almost to be to yeah. push it to that extreme like it was just a really good experience and his older brother actually even though they live in the desert they all have cell phones and so they they were able to they will any money that they make by doing construction work in other villages that i've actually given my number and they've actually tried and called me like it's they always try to keep in contact despite the barriers with networks and stuff and okay. also 
yeah, even through email at the camp, they were mm-hmm. able to keep in contact. So, uh-huh. Karthia, any strong stories or you know heart touching anecdotal stories? Um, well, the thi- uh, like in the beginning, all, like you don't know the stories of the kids uh-huh. at all, okay. but just from being there quite a while, yeah. you learn a lot. And mm-hmm. one thing that really touched me, for example, that aunt who came to me begging, like, please let my son uh-huh. in this like uh, program. Uh-huh. She's like, his father committed suicide, you know, a few months uh-huh. ago. Like he needs the confidence, he mm-hmm. needs this. And just I just I just remember her saying that to me, uh-huh. and I I let him in the program, right? Okay. But um. I just remember a lot of the kids didn't have fathers, right? And that really like stuck to me. And and and, and they're just so they brave died and strong. In the war or did they leave? To or the just a trauma, and uh-huh. you know, there's an alcohol problem, right? Okay. So lack of unemployment, right? Uh-huh. Things like that, uh-huh. I guess, cause suicide. Uh-huh. Um, one of the really great memories I had was we took a uh, a trip, and uh-huh. it was probably about seventy kids in this old ratty uh, like bus yeah. and we went down to Kashuna Beach oh, right. and all the kids yes. dressed up like to their in their best outfits and I'm like oh. we're going to the beach yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> like you know but they were so excited, excited. It's their right first trip, probably, yeah, yeah and like a lot of them and they were all got in the water in their nice Punjabi sho- suits yeah. and so forth yeah, yeah. and like you know them trying to swim like me holding their hands and yeah, they're like yeah. look I'm swimming right with their legs like floating yeah, yeah. Right? and just like that like yeah. just that I- exposure something so simple makes them so happy uh-huh. and I've never been in a more fun bus like on mm. the bus ride the like the kids are like in the aisles dancing. They brought like bongs and they're uh, playing and we're uh, singing all these songs and they're dancing. Like uh-huh. I've never had so much fun just uh-huh. doing something so simple, you uh-huh. know. So uh-huh. I'll always remember that. Yeah. And also another thing was just the concert on the last day. Uh-huh. I've never seen such like like they were just so proud of themselves, you know, uh-huh. after they got off the stage, after they performed, right? Uh-huh. Just uh-huh. that that those proud moments. Like I can I can remember their faces, right? Uh-huh. Like so clearly. Um, in throughout the whole experience, did you ever feel your personality change? That you know, whenever you go through a tough experience, you it has an effect on your values and your personality. And did you feel that you know we talk about uh, the benefits of travel, and you know, you, you, both of you spoke about you know it opens up your mind, gives you new experiences. But in terms of changing yourself, did you feel that you know you mentioned you you develop patience, right? Did you feel that part of you changed for the better yeah for me like uh so i'm in the process of planning a wedding Uh so i know just in terms of color coordinations or all these like little things you know you just think at the end of the day like are you kidding me like is this really important like who cares Uh so you just learn to let things that really don't have any meaning you Uh you get a sense to let them go right it uh, doesn't really matter uh, and you think like wow these kids or the people there would uh, never be worrying about these things uh, and at the end of the day it's not important right uh, so just to let things that are not important go yeah mm. i agree i could mimic a lot of things you just said just like uh, just putting things into perspective was what i got out of my experiences abroad um uh-huh. just like the little things in life really don't matter and uh-huh. there are bigger issues out there that need to be dealt with uh-huh. and me worrying about the kind of clothes that I'm wearing or the shoes that I'm wearing is mm-hmm. it's it's meaningless. It's mm-hmm. it's it's first world problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, putting things in perspective and also like volunteering abroad also it challenges me and it g- allowed me to get to know myself better. Put me in mm-hmm. situations where you know seeing blood like I was doing helping helping to do cataract eye surgeries in uh-huh. <clears throat> in the north in Rajasthan mm-hmm. uh, with the assistance of a doctor uh-huh. and just like using exacto knife and uh-huh. and like alcohol to slit open the eye iris part uh-huh. um that just like i, I actually b- cried mm-hmm. because i couldn't handle the blood and touching a human like that so All it really right, yeah. it really uh, pushed the barriers of what and, and, in a, and put me in a situation where i would never be in, in uh-huh. back home so okay. it really pushed my barriers and allowed me to learn about a lot about myself and i realized uh-huh. like i could never work in a hospital uh-huh. hospitals itself here give me the shivers to bring to bring this back you know in terms of of who we are and, ide- and our identity, uh, you know, many of our youth, um, I, sh- I shouldn't say many, some of our youth are choosing to volunteer in South America, in Africa, and different places, different third world or second world countries. Karthia, what made your experience more powerful by working with our people 
in in uh, you know in uh, northern Sri Lanka, north and east Sri Lanka. Uh, yeah. I don't know about more powerful, but okay. it was a, it was powerful well, just yeah. because um, well, I think just that connection in language uh -huh. is so huge, uh -huh. right? So I know I improved my ability to speak Tamil, and uh -huh. I think just seeing and I think it's just like what I said earlier. Uh -huh. It's like that could have been me, uh -huh. you know, or uh -huh. like I I guess. Th that makes the connection mm -hmm. so strong the fact yeah. that it's like we're so connected mm -hmm. in like the experiences of you know of like our ancestry and so forth right mm -hmm. and a lot of just the cultural connections that we have uh -huh. right i mean th that just makes it so powerful i guess okay. yeah and uh part of it i know that there are times you wanted to go to sri lanka to do work but because whether it's family or because of the war you weren't able um, if you were, to, if you could go back, what difference do you think there would be in terms of volunteering in the Middle East or in Africa or in India compared to val uh, volunteering yeah. back home with with our people? I guess for me, just in general, it was I found it more difficult for me from a logistical point of view to go volunteer in Sri Lanka. Yeah, yeah. Um, reason being why I had yeah. I decided to go to other places, but also gave me a world view. Uh -huh. um, but sorry to get back to like for me to volunteer in Sri Lanka for me it would be more like me helping out my own family or friends like I definitely feel more of a connection to the people uh -huh. um, also being able to it would be more of a personal benefit uh -huh. than I think uh -huh. uh, anything and uh, just being able to make that connection uh -huh. not that's not to say that I didn't make a similar connection to people in different parts uh -huh. of the world we're all human beings we uh -huh. all have red blood uh -huh. um, I find the same thing but I just logistically it was a lot harder for me to Go back to like a uh -huh. but yeah and like just thinking about it and just as a secondary school teacher thinking uh -huh. about my kids uh -huh. i don't have stronger connections with tamil kids more than any other kid like uh -huh. kids are kids yeah, right yeah. at the end of the day or uh -huh. the people who you meet are yeah. who they are like uh -huh. it doesn't necessarily mean you need to go volunteer in sri lanka just because of that identity uh -huh. it was nice uh -huh. right but i mean i i feel like i would have made just as great of connections anywhere else uh -huh. And I also find a lot of these organizations, mm -hmm. also they're hesitant to go to Sri Lanka, especially because it's such a contentious place mm -hmm. um, with politics and the war and stuff. So mm -hmm. that's something that with Operation Grounds, well, I actually tried to start a trip, trip trip to, to Sri, Sri Lanka, Lanka and I planned it all out. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the biggest barrier was they started issuing visas. And so Americans had to start getting visas and stuff. And there was a lot of issues. I couldn't get a visa at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that kind of defeated that put that down the drain because okay. logistically I, I just couldn't go as a trip leader mm -hmm. so and what advice would you have for youth who are thinking right now you know it's Christmas holidays they're thinking towards the summer they want to plan out their year what advice would you give them in terms of you know it's a very easy option to take on a job to take and make money help pay for your tuition it's not like we don't have our own financial challenges here you know tuition is a reality uh, but how, how would you advise kids to what on what in terms of what choice to make volunteering or you know making money here yeah. um, I guess speaking from my personal experience it's mm. just if, if you're someone that really does want to try something like this like volunteer abroad or travel I'd say do it as early as you can mm -hmm. um, I, I was able to realize really early in the game that you know as life goes on you get more and more busier more and more commitments less mm. and less time less and less vacation I knew when I started working full-time I'm only going to get, get that two weeks like your friend mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so making the most of your summer holidays, March break, winter holidays um, is key. And also trying to do it earlier when you're young. Not only is it cheaper, mm -hmm. you're more flexible in life. You don't have those commitments. So basic principle, do it as early as you can because mm -hmm. it's harder when you get start working and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, some other piece of advice, just do your research. Also talk to people who have gone abroad uh -huh. and the kind of orga their experiences with organizations and which ones were good which ones were bad and just talking to people within your network I'm mm -hmm. sure there are people that have done this kind of stuff so just networking and research and also budgeting yourself and accordingly as they don't make excuses uh -huh. and tell uh, just like in your head right mm -hmm. you know it's like oh well I really want to go but I'm not because I need to find a job or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like, don't like leave those excuses behind and just mm -hmm. realize you are blocking yourself from going. Like, either you really want to go and you're going to do it, mm -hmm. or you don't. 
you don't want to go as much. Mm -hmm. And number two is tell as many people as possible that mm -hmm. you are going to go because yeah. those constant questions from people yeah. tell asking you, like, didn't you say you were going okay. abroad, you know, yeah, for two yeah. months? What and happened gonna, to that? It's going to push it. Yeah, you it pushes it. you and it propels you because uh -huh. it's scary. It is. And like you're going to yeah. have like a range of emotions. Uh -huh. So, you know, just uh -huh. tell as many people. Okay. Thank you, Karthia. Thank you, Pranavan. Uh, youth, I have no doubt you constantly hear you're the future and that the future is now. Our history teaches us that the decisions that we make now inevitably shape our individual and collective future. So it is with good reason that you're urged to consider how you will give back to your people, Canada and the world. The youth time period is characterized by high ideals, energy and enthusiasm. So during these holidays, Instead of easily getting caught up in making money, buying things, and trying to keep up with your friends, give thought to how you can give back to your people and places that you love and cherish. It will enrich the lives of others, and more importantly, it will enrich your life with meaning and purpose. Thank you, dear viewers, for tuning into TVI's Crossroads. I'm your host, Parthi Khandaval. Have a good week. Tamil Nadu 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 Tamil